Hello, I'm Dr. Kim Bruno, uh, clinical team for Vibrant America. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the Tickborne 2.0 panel, the features of the panel, the interpretation of the results, and some clinical pearls as far as diagnosis. When you first receive your panel, on page two, you will notice this interpretation of report text block. It is very tempting to scroll right past this page and not pay attention to it. I do urge you to use this page as a very helpful reference. All the information that I'm going to go over today in this walkthrough video is in this page and you can refer back to it when you are reviewing your results. Next, we do include a summary page. This is going to be the summary of everything that has come up either moderate or high within the test results and if the PCR has been detected. The summary page in a tick-borne panel is truly just that. It is a summary and is very helpful to come back to you after you've looked at the detail of the report to be able to make the appropriate diagnosis based on the levels of IgGs, IgMs, and PCRs that are showing in the full report. So what are we testing and how is it interpreted? On the Vibrant 2.0, Tickborne 2.0 panel, we are doing indirect testing and direct testing. We are testing with the Vibrant Immunochip technology with the IgGs and IgMs. And then the direct testing, we are testing the PCRs, which is looking for the genetic material of the organism. When we are testing for the IgGs and the IgMs on the immunochip technology, our reference range is either in control, which is below 10, moderate, which is 10.1 to 20, or high, which is above 20.1. Please note that moderate within the literature and sometimes throughout the test is also considered borderline and high is also considered positive. The shading of yellow and red will remain the same whether it is listed as moderate, borderline, and it will stay as red whether it is high or positive. When we are trying to determine if the IgGs or IgMs are clinically relevant, we will always need to correlate that to the presenting symptom profile and the history of the patient. So when you have the IgGs in a moderate level, very likely this is indicative of a past exposure. However, do correlate that clinically to see if it makes sense. The IgG in a positive or high level often means that that is a reactivated or still active infection within the system. Then when we look at the IgMs, either in the moderate or positive for the IgM, it is indicative of a current active infection, usually a more robust reaction of the immune system. Again, correlating clinically to make sure that this all lines up with how the patient is presenting. So the first page of Lyme we are going to come to is for Borrelia burgdorferi. Borrelia burgdorferi is the main spirochete that is causative for Lyme disease. It has two criteria as far as meeting uh, for a diagnosis. And why are there two criteria? Well, the CDC criteria was originally developed as a surveillance criteria, not a diagnostic criteria. It has not been updated over the years with any new research that has come out with tick-borne diseases. So therefore, the lab has come up with an internally validated um, alternative criteria utilizing CDC samples and it has been published in third-party publication, which link is available in your provider portal. So traditional Lyme testing for Borrelia burgdorferi is a two-tier test where we are looking at 
whole cell sonicates or organism levels and peptides, as well as recumbent proteins. So the tier one of the two tier testing is this VLSE1, the C6 peptide, and the two whole cell sonicates at the bottom. The, two, the tier two part of the testing is looking for what is known as banding or recumbent proteins. And this really denotes different portions of the spirochete. For instance, like P41 is coding for the flagella, whereas P23 to 25 is coding for a surface protein. So it's really looking at a more individual portion of the spirochete. So in order to receive a positive either CDC criteria or Lyme, alternative Lyme criteria, you need to meet specific um, requirements of each the tier one and tier two testing. So for the CDC criteria, you need one positive, meaning in the red of the VLSE1 C6 peptide or whole cell sonicate, and in combination with that, you need two of the following three antigens that are also positive. And those are going to be the 23 to 25, the 39, and the 41. The alternative criteria, one of the big differences is that we will um, consider a positive or a borderline of the VLSE1 C6 peptide or whole cell sonicate and two of the following six antigens are again either positive or borderline. That is the 23 to 25, 31, 34, 39, 41, and 83 to 93. So as you can see for this patient in the IgM, they have some borderlines for their tier one testing which does meet this first part of the alternative criteria, but they do not have two of the six bands. They only have one of the appropriate six bands. So therefore, both of their IgMs are negative. Going on to the IgG, again, for the CDC criteria, you need one positive of the tier one testing here or here, and five of the following 10 antigens must be positive. That's 18, 23 to 25, 28, 30, 39, 41, 45, 58, 66, and 83 to 93. For the alternative criteria, you need one positive or borderline of that tier one testing, and then two of any of the 12 bands in the tier two testing. So this whole section from 18 down to 83 to 93 are acceptable bands for the alternative criteria and you would need two of those in either positive or borderline. So if we're looking at this patient, they meet the tier one testing of the borderline here and here with the whole cell sonicate. And they also have at least two, they actually have three, of those borderline bands in the um, 12 appropriate sections here. So therefore, they have met the alternative line criteria as having a positive result. They have not met the CDC criteria. We do have third-party published research with our sensitivity and specificity reproducibility and published validations, all available in your patient portal. Um, you just click on the Education's Resource tab, go to the Tickborne um, folder, and you'd be able to download that to be able to see the difference between the criteria. So next, we're going to talk about other Borrelia species. Um, Borrelia burgdorferi is by far not the only Borrelia species that is causative for Lyme test, and having a negative criteria for Borrelia burgdorferi doesn't necessarily mean a negative tick-borne test. There are currently 21 different Borrelia species that have been shown to cause Lyme's disease. 
Vibrant offers the most comprehensive testing on the market and tests for 17 of those Borrelia species. As we talked about previously, it is very important to always correlate clinically through a complete history. The reason for that is because each organism can demonstrate different primary symptoms, can be found in different geographical regions, and also have different specific vector and reservoirs. Within your testing, at the top of each Borrelia um, species that we're talking about as it relates to Lyme's disease, we will have um, that type of information listed in this word block. So for example, when this patient comes back with a high IgM for Borrelia garini, we would like to question them as part of their history. Have they been to Europe or Asia? Have they had exposure to, of, of, um, to hard ticks? Have they spent a lot of time around in the outdoors where there could be lots of different birds or reptiles which could be carrying those ticks? Initially, maybe the symptoms could have been low-grade fever, fatigue, stiff neck, arthritis, or they could also have more neurological manifestations are common with this Borrelia species versus some of the other Borrelia species, which could be more common with arthrosis. After you've looked through all of your Borrelia species, you will come to the co-infections part of the test. The four main co-infections, which can be found on the co-infections one portion of the panel, are Babesia, Bartonella, Anaplasma, and Ehrlichthyia. Each of these co-infections has very predominant um, symptom profiles. So when we are seeing testing like this, where we are seeing higher and moderate levels in the IgG, we are going to try and cor clinically correlate to whether or not that is from a past exposure or is relating to their current clinical picture. For instance, Bartonella's primary symptoms tend to be more central nervous sym uh, symptoms are far more out of proportion than musculoskeletal symptoms. The patients may have mood swings, rage, psychiatric manifestations. They also could have headaches. Another hallmark of Bartonella are these stretch marks or um, odd stretch-like rashing that are new or out of place. So talking to your patients about these symptom profiles as it relates to co-infections can help you to get a very good picture about past exposures or current clinical symptoms. The co-infections 2 panel has co-infections that are less common, however, still are tick-borne, but also can have um, differing vectors, very much like West Nile virus is going to be more mosquito-driven, but can be a co-infection as part of somebody who is struggling with a um, Lyme diagnosis. So on our co-infections 2 panel, we have rickettsia, Powassan virus, tick-borne encephalitis virus, West Nile virus, C. pneumoniae, Coxsackie virus, and mycoplasma pneumoniae. As you can see, um, just like on the previous, the Lyme panel and the Co-infections 1 panel, we are testing for the IgG, the IgM, and the PCR for all of these organisms. The opportunistic infections panel rounds out the Tick-Borne 2.0. That is the fourth and final section of the entire panel. We include the opportunistic infections because they are just that. They are opportunistic. When a patient is struggling with a chronic Lyme situation or co-infection situation, their immune systems are um, in a state where they have the susceptibility to other infections in their environment or the reactivation of infections and viruses that were from their past. That can then complicate the clinical picture as far as how you are going to move forward with treatment and how well the patient responds to treatment. 
So on the opportunistic infections panel, we are looking for cytomegalia virus, Epstein-Barr virus, parvovirus, capsin, toxoplasmic gondii, HSV1 and 2, HHV6 and 7, and strep A. Following the same principles that we had on that first reference range page is that we are going to be looking for something that's either a more recent or more robust reaction, or we are looking for something that was a past infection and possibly reactivating in these higher levels. And we're going to be correlating clinically all along the way. This is a snapshot of everything that is included on the tick-borne panels that we offer at Vibrant America. The tick-borne 1.0 panel includes everything in the Lyme and tick-borne relapsing fever column, as well as your co-infections 1 panel. This is the tick-borne 1.0. This is most commonly run for patients who have had a more recent tick bite or um, in a more acute flare versus a patient who has been chronically ill or this is something they have been dealing with for a long time and you are not sure which way, which infection to go after, then we would be looking at the tick-borne 2.0 marker um, because this includes the Lyme, co-infections one, additionally co-infections two, all of these here, and all of the opportunistic infections. Please utilize your provider portal tools that are available to you when you log into your Vibrant America provider portal. Then you would go under the Educations tab, which is on the left side of your screen. Scroll down to the Tick-Borne folder. You will find things like this Lifestyle Intervention and Supplemental Guide. You're going to learn information about the technology that we use for diagnosing and creating the labs of tick-borne diseases. And you'll also be able to find the um, copy and link to our third party research. If you would like additional information and additional continuing education, ILADS is a wonderful research, uh, resource for anything to do with Lyme and the associated diseases. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any further questions about the interpretation of a tick-borne panel for your specific patient, please schedule a clinical consultation with a doctoral member of the, our clinical team, and we would be happy to assist.